Even in high winds and focusing on the vegetation, Alan is easy to pick out. That's likely because Alan the lifeboat is orange. And this is the first time I've ended up with lens wobble on my proper heavy duty tripod. Must be seriously gusty. It actually reminds me of the first half of the final day as we brought Alan west into the marina at the end of the summer. The gale is coming from the southwest, so there's lots of white horses, but curiously small choppy waves as there's not been enough space for the height to grow in these sheltered waters. I presume this is a shallow area as the waves are breaking around that marker. Anyhow, enough of staring out to sea. I've got hold of a fine pair of 50 amp hour 12 volt lithium ion phosphate batteries. These are the sort slightly less likely to spontaneously erupt into a ball of flame than other designs, albeit with a slightly less energy storage density. I'm using these to put together a lightweight but punchy 24 volt power pack. So nice high quality wires able to handle around double the planned 50 amp current demand and a 60 amp inline circuit breaker, which doubles as one of the two isolator switches. But what is this power pack for? All right, you lot, I've had a new arrival. It's come in this box here and it's come from China, as it appears most things do these days. Anyway, this is the, the first of what I hope will be a number of electric motor pods. And this is an all-in-one unit that I've got from a manufacturer called, I think it's Apis Queen. Um, I don't know what on earth that means, but basically it's one of those brands that use, I'm presuming, a number of ready-made components because I've seen things looking very similar to this from other manufacturers um, but not exactly the same so I think what they do is they have the, the motor pod unit, unit itself and then maybe they attach their own frame prop prop guard um, and then inside there is a built-in ESC so that's the um, the electronic speed controller I believe that's what it is um, anyway so that is the all-in-one unit that then all it requires is on this end power and then a three um, pin connector for the actual um, for, for, the, for the, uh, the dial which is actually here just a little um, PWM anyway so the idea being that this has a thrust of in its current configuration 22 kilograms and that will be absolutely fine I hope to power Allenson the third our launch and also potentially to be a bow thruster and that's going to need a mount that basically is uh, removable that sits on the bow of the boat and sits in one direction I think there's nearly as much reverse thrust as there is forward thrust so I don't need to have one in both directions and I should be able to mount it somewhere quite cleverly so that it doesn't bash into things but gives us a little bit of well bow to, bow to the uh, port or starboard when we are trying to manoeuvre in tight anchorages or in marinas right so I need to do a test because I won't lie, I've had a bit of an argument with the manufacturer already because they've supplied it with a not a particularly wide gauge power um, wire. And this is a, I think this is a 1.6 meter long um, power cable, which is presumably what they think is enough to get it out the water and into the dry. Now, I'm gonna have to extend that anyhow for, mer for various reasons. And I'll use a much, much, much thicker gauge wire in order to minimize voltage drop. But even at this distance, I think I'm right in saying that this is 16 AWG. It's not rated as far as I can make out. And basically I kept on pushing the manufacturer to the point at which they wouldn't respond to me because they just kept on repeating the same nonsense and telling me I didn't understand what I was talking about. But basically, 16 gauge wire can't safely carry 50 amps. This is rated to 50 amps at 24 volts at full power. Now, even if you don't care so much about voltage drop and you just think, well, okay, we're, we're just gonna lose some power, life goes on. There are two reasons why you need to have the correct gauge of wire for your given current and voltage. The first is, to avoid voltage drop, which basically means you don't get your device on the end performing as well as it could. But then there's a the safety component. Can the wire take that current without becoming uh, too warm and potentially failing and turning almost into, I guess, like a fuse and, and, and popping on you? A pop, I suppose, would actually be the best outcome. It could actually be a damn sight more dangerous than that. So I'm going to do a test. And their argument is, as far as I could work out, I'll, I'll put a couple of excerpts from the conversation I had with, with Lynn at Apis Queen. Um, their argument is that because the cable is going to be under the water, that takes care of the cooling. Now, I don't buy that, and particularly because some of the wire is going to have to be in the air. You can't have this bit here 
underwater. It's not waterproof. So at least some of this cable is going to be above the surface of the water and is going to heat up. So I'm going to do a test at full power, at full chat, and I'm going to basically see what happens. This is within warranty and believe me, if this is not safe, I'm not keeping it and they're not keeping my money. So we'll see how things are going. I found another manufacturer of almost exactly the same unit who, um, on well, another Chinese manufacturer. They basically don't appear to be um, European or North American people who make these. Anyway, they have been fantastic in the to and fro of emails and this that, and the other and they've actually been able to give me a quote for a number of these units at was pretty much whatever current I want them set to which is which is great they can have them up to I think about 35 kilograms thrust but at too many volts for me so I'm going for a for a happy medium so I think that even if this one doesn't explode in a, in a ball of flame on me I'm probably going to get the rest of the units that I need from this other manufacturer they they visually look very very similar and so I, I, I suspect they're using the same um, raw parts as it were Anyway, let's see how this goes. There's a certain level of trust involved in these ready-made units. I hope this gland in particular is properly sealed. I may get some additional sealant involved there though. Time for a dry test. I've not connected all the ingredients together yet. Click the circuit breaker to power on. This causes the unit to spring into action with some beeping and then the little PWM controller seems to just work. The three pin plug that fits into the controller which by the way is small, not waterproof, and I intend to mount into a larger, tougher handset, can fit into the socket either way round. I tested it back to front, and reassuringly the motor gave a I'm not very happy beep, so I can be confident to mark up which way around it needs to be for future reference. Dry test success. Now for some water. I thought one of my many storage bins would fit the bill, and really this test isn't so much to confirm the motor spins underwater, I'm sure it will, Rather, it's to give the motor some cooling as I run it at the full rated current of 50 amps and then see what's up with those thin wires carrying all that juice. I mounted the pod onto a makeshift bracket and then dunked it. To be honest, I've no idea how powerful 22 kilograms of thrust actually is in practice, so this was something of an experiment. The test tank might be gruesomely under spec for what I'm up to. With only the slightest power applied, the pod moved itself along the tank and didn't just push the water around, so my suspicions were likely correct. I went and held the bracket as well as I could, and this built up to only about 50% of the thrust. It was hard to keep control of, whilst keeping another hand on the little controller, which I needed to keep dry of course. I do have a remote control too, but let's start simply, eh? I'm going to have to make a proper mount down in the marina on the pontoons to do a test like this again. But no, not for now, I was determined to see if those wires got angry at high currents. So I thought, well, why not do a dry, or rather a damp test? And so I did. I decided to spin up the motor outside of the cooling water and cautiously increase the speed whilst keeping an eye on the temperature of the pod's body. It didn't get anywhere approaching hot. I'd say warm to the touch even after a few minutes. So I took the power up to 100%. Then it was over to assess the all important 16 gauge power wires. Unsurprisingly, and taking into account none of the length was submerged, the wire became warm to the touch after about a minute or so. It didn't get hot, nor did it melt, blow or otherwise fail on this test, but I decided to stop after a couple of minutes. My conclusion is that indeed, 16 gauge wire is inappropriate for carrying 50 amps, even if half the wire is water cooled. Now, this is a 500 pound unit, not a toy. If I spoke to the manufacturer about a return, I would get some kickback, and so I'm probably just going to rewire half of the multi-wire cable myself with 10 or 12 gauge wire, double reseal it, and then source the rest of the pods from the Chinese company I had far better communication with and who used 12 gauge wire. Direct your ire at the comment section, please. Meanwhile, a fun tangent for you. I bought a couple of thick strips of pure silicon and some braided nylon rope. Why? Well, I've been unhappy with the shock dampening system I've used on various Arctic sledging expeditions over the years, Generally, people use a couple of loops of elastic shock cord. The issue is that most of them fail in temperatures around minus 40 degrees, which is no fun. They also need a secondary rope to save the elastic when the forces are too great. I decided to put together a super cold rated version of the dampers you see set on boat mooring lines. So, a couple of holes in each end of the silicon strips, the rope passed through the first two, spiralled around the silicon, and then through the other two holes. This acts to reduce sharp shocks pulling on the already slightly stretchy nylon rope. Not a bad start, but a little heavy, 
and I'd like to have a little bit more stretch. I think a series of additional 12mm holes along the length will do the trick. I'll report back. I bet you can't wait. Remember a few episodes ago, I noticed some dampness was appearing along the inside of this structure and that the waves, especially on the bow, were somehow getting slowly through. Back from VO Alex to real Alex. This is going to be a massive conundrum. Behind the PVC fender, there is a long metal strip. It's a galvanized steel strip. And there are a series of crosshead bolt heads all the way along. Some of them are behind little plugs and you can get access. Some of them you can see down the little gap and not. The problem is that the PVC runs around the back, as far as I can tell, of that strip. And I presume it's the pressure of each, um, uh, uh, each bolt holding it onto the side that actually provides the seal. This isn't just hanging on to the metal, it can't just be unscrewed. It's, it's one thing. It's one entity. And I can see that there are, you can see little washers and bolt heads hiding behind there. But the challenge I have is getting this off and there's a danger I have to take the metal strip off as well. And I just, that basically means unbolting the top of the boat from the bottom of the boat. This is not as easy as I thought it was gonna be. <sighs> Alan. I had another thorough look, checking that the method of fixing didn't vary in different sections. Indeed, some parts of the PVC fender do appear to be captive behind the steel strip, and others just bolted on with spacers. I gently prized it back for a better look, and actually tried to unscrew a bolt. It didn't seem to want to move, but instead span in place. I have a totally different idea for resealing this section, but won't lead you on that just yet. So does anyone have any bright ideas from your end about how to do this quickly and effectively, and without damaging what otherwise appears to be a perfectly strong and functional part of Alan's structure. Let's see what you lot come up with. In the meantime, I'll get straight on to editing the next Alan episode, an Arctic episode too, and a long overdue next installation of my other YouTube channel, arguably, which you should all be subscribing to as well. Bye.